So hello and welcome everyone to this conversation on generative AI that is recorded for the United Nations ITU workshop on the legal and technical challenges of generative AI. So the workshop itself will take place in the beginning of July 2023, and it will address some of the core implications of generative AI for regulation, business, and society at large. My name is Philip Hacker, and I hold the chair for Law and Ethics of the Digital Society at European New School of Digital Studies at the European University Viadrina in Germany near Berlin. I'm also a co-convener of this workshop, the ITU workshop, together with Professor Sarah Hammer from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And today it is my pleasure to be joined by Brian. Brian Williams is an intern at the AI for Good program of the United Nations ITU, and he studies machine learning at the University of Pennsylvania. More importantly um, than the two of us, we are joined today, and that is really a great pleasure, by Miriam Vogel. So we will have this conversation with her, who is a well-known person in the AI space, of course. She's not only the president of Equal AI, a nonprofit that was created to reduce uh, bias and unconscious bias in AI, but also the chair of the National AI Advisory Committee to US President Biden. And notably, she also hosts a great podcast, which is In AI We Trust, and it's uh, produced together with the World Economic Forum. And she has all kinds of experience, of course, vast experience in policy and research, both at the White House and in research institutions like the Dana Fraber Cancer Institute. So, um, Miriam, welcome, and um, many thanks for joining us for this conversation. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Philip and Brian. It's great to be with you. Wonderful. So perhaps let's get started uh, by talking about some of the things that we're all a little bit concerned about, and that is AI bias and how that might actually change with the advent of generative AI. So in your um, role as a president of Equal AI, you're leading an institution that has a pledge. It has a pledge to uphold responsible AI um, by, for example, testing for you know, unconscious bias, by taking actions when you identify harmful patterns, or generally by asking others, other players, other people in industry and in policy to you know, join this really important effort toward responsible AI. Do you think that this pledge somehow has to change now with generative AI. So what what are the things that you're thinking about when it comes to generative AI and, and, and bias? That is such a great question, Philip. Thank you for starting us off with um, really thinking about how the world has changed since generative AI has become uh, such an important part of all of our homes in the last few months and our daily lives. Um, the good news is, you know, as you know, from doing responsible AI work, a lot of the infrastructure and thought put into place does not change. It puts us in a good position with generative AI as well. To be sure, there are new questions and challenges. I do not underestimate or minimize that in any way. But I do think that the responsible AI frameworks and good governance puts you in a good position to be doing the same work of mitigating bias, cybersecurity threats, and other risks with generative AI as well. Uh, so I think when we're talking about the pledge specifically, which has three main parts, committing to look for bias and other harms in your AI, committing to take action when you find these harms, and committing to ask your vendors and partners whether they have done the same. Those three things will put you in a good position, no matter if you're using narrow AI or someday in the future, potentially using a, a different iteration of newer technologies. That absolutely makes sense. I think Brian, Brian has a follow up on this. I guess this is kind of related, but could you talk a little bit about the traditional AI models and generative AI models um, exhibit bias and discrimination and how those ways differ and then how we can kind of deal with those differences? Yeah, so I think, you know, certainly not with your audience here who's so sophisticated, but I think for many people, there's a misunderstanding that generative AI is a wholly new animal, which you all know it's not. It's it's much more uh, sophisticated. It's much more user friendly in so many ways. But at the end of the day, there's algorithms that have been trained on data, uh, granted many, many more times the amount of data. The ways that you would find bias and other forms of discrimination would pop up in similar ways. It's been trained on language. It's been trained in a way that reflects our societal biases and, and flaws. And so, you know, we need to be mindful of how we're building these systems. 
it's the same mindset, whether it's generative AI or more narrow traditional forms of AI. Uh, that said, it is harder to mitigate. So I would say the identification part remains consistent. Mitigation is going to be much more challenging given the unlimited amounts of data that are now being uh, used as the basis, as the machine that is training these, these systems and, and the number of people that are now also iterating and adding their input and, and potential biases. So I, I think that identification place is the same, I think, or very similar and, and good models for and foundations for how we will use generative AI testing and responsible governance going forward. I think really the question becomes the mitigation piece. How do you correct for them when you don't have as much uh, control over the data sets and, and know even who all the users are and what kind of biases they'd be bringing in? Um, but kind of shifting um, size to look at it, like the brighter, the potential brighter side of things. Do you imagine any ways that um, generative AI could be used to actually foster equality in business education. So any like the positive benefits for equality in business education with generative AI. I absolutely do. I think that's why I'm so excited. I, I, we at Equal AI are AI net positive, meaning we are very aware of the risks and the potential scale discrimination and other threats that we are uh, putting out into the world. But I also believe strongly that we're at this critical moment where we can realize a better future. We can use this powerful tool to create opportunity, whether it means creating ways to hear people whom we haven't been able to hear before, whether it's language that, that has been a barrier. Obviously, we've seen already AI so helpful in helping us communicate and speak and learn from one another and to one another, in addition to those with speech impediments and other disabilities where AI is such a great tool to help us hear and see people that we haven't for too long. Um, I think that if we are intentional, there are ways to use AI to help us detect discrimination. I think it's too easy to say AI will fix everything, but if we unpack that and think about what that means to use AI as a tool for good, to think about how we can create an amazing tutor for, for our kids to be learning from beyond what they could have access to, particularly in remote areas. But we have to be careful. We have to know that they need to have access to systems. They need to have access to Wi-Fi. Um, and we need to be deeply careful and intentional as we're using it as a tool, whether it's for education, whether it's for upskilling and training to make sure that uh, the autocorrect language is not teaching us sexist, racist, and, and other forms of discrimination in it, as we are using it to better ourselves. And indeed, there is great potential um, if we do this right. And we have to get it right because it is being deployed everywhere on this planet and it will make a huge difference. Um, EU lawmakers are trying to get things right at the moment with the AI Act. But uh, also on the global level, there was a meeting uh, of the G7 leaders in Hiroshima um, just a few weeks ago. And looking a bit at the policy side of this, in which you're also very you know, uh, versed and, and invested, I was wondering if you could comment uh, a little bit on what your take is on the G7 Hiroshima AI process, which was launched at the Hiroshima meeting and in which the G7 nations committed to working together toward a responsible AI framework. Would that be a lever? Would that be an avenue perhaps for integration, you know, international outreach of these more inclusive practices. Absolutely. I'm so delighted that we are seeing more of these international conversations because the risk here is that while lawmakers are trying to be more thoughtful and not, uh, you know, really do us the disadvantage of not being prepared, not having regulations and, and thoughtful policies in place. The risk is that if they do too much alone, that we're almost in a worse position. Uh, as we know, AI has no borders. And so trying to construct it in such a way or pretending that there can be legal boundaries is really not helpful. It's really uh, counterproductive in so many ways. And so I'm delighted to see that we're having these conversations and that they're thinking about the most interesting and complicated issues here of governance and intellectual property rights I'm so delighted that the Hiroshima process has started to tackle this um, and, and create consistency because, you know, in intellectual property alone, you know, how can you know how to operate? How can you know either how to build an AI system or deploy an AI system built by somebody else if you don't know uh, whose rights you are violating and what the rules of the road are, so to speak? So this is absolutely something that should be discussed in the international fora as has already started with the Hiroshima AI process and other places, the TTC and other places. You know, the Hiroshima process is, is only just starting, but in the EU, uh, the proposal for the AI Act came out in April of 2021. And uh, just very recently, the EU parliament passed uh, its position uh, on the AI Act that will be the basis of the trilogue 
for the next half year until just about Christmas to finalize the EU's position on the AI Act. So uh, one of the things that we keep hearing uh, in the EU space, because you mentioned, you know, AI has no borders and obviously it doesn't. But one of the things we keep hearing is that there might be this Brussels effect that we kind of know from the GDPR, whereby uh, the GDPR set some standards and it was copied or at least uh, it was to a certain extent emulated by other countries were modeling their uh, data protection rules on the GDPR. Is this something that plays a role in the U.S. policy space as well, where, where people would acknowledge that this could happen, that more countries might follow suit? Or do you think that the AI Act, you know, might not have such a strong Brussels effect whereby, you know, it inspires other nations to actually come up with similar regulations? I think we can fully expect the Brussels effect. And I think for that reason, the start of this process in itself to develop the EU AI Act has had a tremendous impact. I think few years ago, people didn't expect there could be AI regulation. Um, you know, they saw some stumbling in the U.S. We, we've seen it here, their inability to, you know, create sufficient privacy regulations and, and clarifications policies. Uh, and, and I think if you're looking across the globe, it seemed hard to imagine uh, policymakers prepared to take this on. So I think even the start of the process was a critical moment for uh, the, all of those that were both building and licensing, deploying AI to understand that there was going to be governance uh, by the various regulatory bodies across the world. So I think even it, the process and the, the seriousness in which they've been putting to creating their rights-based approach, categorizing, has and, and sharing the drafts has been instructive and pivotal in creating action and creating uh, a safety net that needs to be put in place because obviously AI, as you said, is being deployed at scale at this moment. We don't have a few years for all the different countries to lay out their reg their regulatory frameworks. We need we need to action now. And the, the challenge is if you're a company trying to figure out what the rules of the road are, uh, there's not certainty at this moment. And so I think anything we're doing to create a certainty as to what the expectations are is in our best interest. Uh, and so I applaud the fact that this effort is underway, that they got this started. They were one of the first re regions to, to do so in, in, in a way that we know that they've got a track record and people took it seriously. I think that going forward, there's going to need to be iterations. And I think I respect the fact that they are being careful, uh, knowing the power at their fingertips and knowing that there will be this Brussels effect. So if there was sticking with the AI, just for one final thought, if there's one thing you could change or some things, what, what would be uh, things you would like, come up with to perhaps make that act even better? It's a great question. I think one opportunity we don't want to miss is making good on this potential right now of AI for opportunity. I think while it's really important we think about the risks, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that if we are intentional at this moment, like we discussed previously, we can ensure that AI creates more opportunity, more jobs, more education, more inclusivity. So I think that is the role of government and civil society is to mandate what the expectations are. You know, if you're using AI, here's the ways that you need to make sure that that society is ready. I think government has to play that role in, in leading on, on how society can be ready, whether it's you know education for our K through 12, our university level, or upskilling. Um, and, and I think that we would all benefit from some thought at this point as to what the expectations are for those companies that are leading the way and that have the most ability to get us ready. They know what's on the horizon and can make sure that we even know what our AI economy looks like. I think we need to give thought to what do the jobs in five, 10 years look like so that we can work backwards and make sure people are prepared. We need to make sure that we have a digital society that ready where we are, have people who really understand AI that is fueling so much of our daily lives and our work. And it does not mean that everyone needs to be a computer scientist, but we do need to have more digital literacy. We do need to have more opportunity for those who will have lost their jobs to prepare for other similar types of jobs that will be critical in an AI economy. So in addition to thinking about how to prepare society, thinking about how we can be creating more of these opportunities, how we can make sure there is investment and thought to answering these questions about how AI can be more inclusive for those with disabilities that could really benefit from AI tools. And I want to talk a little bit about like the role of content moderation. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on like what's the role of content moder moderation in generative AI and what roles does this play in the U.S. debate on content moderation? 
I do think this is the area where generative AI really takes us into another realm because we can't tell developers who is, we can't ask them who is represented in your data sets and who's not represented, who's over and underpopulated in the same way we are able to before. Content moderation, I have two daughters and I am constantly thinking, worrying about what, what they're being exposed to, uh, even if we are intentional in our house, even if we are trying to moderate in our own world, the content that they are um, being exposed to. You know, I think this is something that's gonna take a lot of deep thought. I think this is an area where we need to have a multi-stakeholder process where we have industry, uh, government, you know, private par public partnerships where civil society comes in as well and helps together answer these questions of what are we exposing ourselves to and our next generation? Uh, what kinds of impacts are we having on their brain? We need to understand psychologically, we've seen some of the harms. We need to continue to be thoughtful and track uh, the implications of these new technologies in this new world that we've dived into head first. Uh, and it needs to have regulatory peace, but we also need industry playing a role uh, because as you know, they're probably 10 years ahead of us in terms of what we're seeing in the public. You know, chat GPT was under iteration several years before it came out. And likewise, they know what's coming down the road. So this really needs to be something with those who are building it, the academic institutions coming in and playing their role, government understanding of the policy side and civil society continuing to ask these questions about how broadly it's impacting us and, and if we're going in the wrong direction and, and how to continue to iterate so that we don't fall off the rails. Like one final question, um, due to the popularity of all these generative models, what kinds of resources do you recommend for listeners who are interested in responsible AI or AI policy? Thank you for that question. I think what we all need to realize now is that thinking about how to use AI, thinking about what the challenges are, what the risks are, it is now all of our problem because we are now using it. It is a role that each of us must play. Um, and so I think that we need to educate ourselves. I think everyone needs to be playing around with these generative models and, uh, and, and understanding what are we working with? looking at how exciting it is, looking at, you know, writing an article in your own words and then and having a basic draft is great. Uh, but what I've done with my daughters is shown this is a very thoughtful answer and you can regenerate and look at different answers, but you also need to look very carefully because there's wrong information in here. There are these hallucinations and there are these very uh, confident answers that are not always true. And so what a great life lesson if we use it in the right way. I think we all need to think about using good AI hygiene. Um, that's a term we like to use at Equal AI with some real basic steps that we all need to be thinking about um, as well as in particular companies using good AI hygiene. So in terms of the companies who are thinking about using AI, who are, who are now building and deploying AI, you need to be thinking about uh, framework. You know, are you using the NIST risk management framework? Are you using some of the great models that are posted online by different companies and organizations? But you have to have a framework in place and you have to have AI principles. You have to think about how your organization's missions and value statements are being either supported or impeded by AI. It's no longer a, a separate question. You can never think any more about AI as, as a discussion for one other person in the organization to think about and not integrating that into your overall conversations about your core mission and values because AI will impact either support or impede your values if you're not thoughtful and intentional going forward. You need to be thinking about accountability at the highest levels. There has to be somebody, if you're using AI in pivotal functions, if you're using it uh, in hiring, if you're using it in ways that are making financial determinations or any other pivotal functions, you need to make sure you have somebody at the highest levels in your C-suite if you're a company deciding uh, these main basic questions about your framework looking at how often you're going to test with the continued iteration of AI, thinking about uh, as these new challenges and risks come up, uh, that you have a plan in place, that you have new uh, processes in place, and that people feel safe, frankly, to bring these risks to your attention so that employees know, um, that your public users know, you want to know what these challenges are and you want to address them. I think it's fine to say it is not perfect because it's AI. There's going to be bias and other impediments that are embedded. Um, but that you're doing your best and that you want to hear about any other challenges or concerns as they come up. You wanna make sure that you have an auditing system in place finally, that um, as we deal particularly with generative AI and have uh, this basic challenge of not being able to put our hands around what is baked in, it was hard enough with traditional AI models and now given the un fathomable amounts of data that are powering it, we need to keep testing and identifying potential harms before they hurt people and before they spread at scale. 
I think that's a great final statement. Thank you so much, Miriam, for this really insightful, inspiring, and exciting conversation. And um, thanks so much for your time and for joining us today. It's great talking with you. Thank you for these thoughtful questions and all the great work that you're doing.